Great. Well, welcome everyone to our Center for Social Medicine and Health Equity um, Translational and Social Sciences uh, seminar. Great to have everyone here. Um, I'm going to be introducing our speaker today, and um, and we'll also we're gonna um, we really would like to have a nice discussion today. So in addition, so after our speaker um, sort of delivers her uh, her comments, we're going to have a couple um, responses, um, and then going to go into into discussion. So I'm going to um, just for the sake of being streamlined, I'm going to introduce both our speaker and our um, respondents. I'm right now at the beginning. Um, so we're really really pleased to be hosting uh, as our speaker today, uh, Nev Jones. She is an interdisciplinary mental health services researcher and is currently assistant professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research has been funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI, and by NIH. And she's currently the PI of an NIMH R01 grant focused on the school, work, and disability benefit trajectories of young adults receiving specialized early psychosis services with a particular orientation to deepening the understanding of the shaping role of social and structural determinants, especially poverty, racism, and provider client explanatory mismatch. She has also has extensive personal and family experience of schizophrenia and its intersections with immigration, poverty, and disability and income-based welfare schemas. In addition to academic work, she has been engaged in service user, survivor activist organizing for the past decade and a half, co-founding Chicago Hearing Voices, the Bay Area Hearing Voices Network, and Transform Mental Health Research. And um, before I introduce her title, I'm going to introduce um, our discussants. One of them um, is well known to, to all you guys, so I'm going to give a very brief uh, introduction to her. That's Helena Hansen. <laughs> um, obviously, she's a psychiatrist, medical anthropologist, interim chair of our UCLA Psychiatry Department, director of the Center for Social Medicine, and one of the architects of the structural competency framework that we're going to discuss today. Our other guests were really pleased, uh, was able to uh, sort of pull some strings to join us at the last minute, and that's uh, Karis Myrick. Karis is a leading mental health advocate and executive known for innovative and inclusive approach to mental health reform and the public disclosure of her personal story, as featured in the New York Times series, Lives Restored. Karis has over 15 years of experience in mental health services, innovations, transformation, and peer workforce development. She is currently the Vice President of Partnerships at Inseparable, the policy liaison for the National Association of Peer Supporters, and on Mental Health of America Board of Directors. She's the developer and host of the podcast, Unapologetically Black Unicorns, focusing on mental health, race equity, and lived experience. Karis has also held numerous national leadership positions, including Chief of Peer and Allied Health Professions for the LA County Department of Mental Health, Director of the Office of Consumer Affairs for the Center for Mental Health Services, of the substance abuse, mental health services, um, substance abuse and mental health services administration, also known as SAMHSA, and she's also been board president of the National Alliance on Mental Illness (NAMI). And Karis Withnev is a co-editor of the Journal of Psychiatric Services uh, Lived Experience and Leadership column, and has authored numerous peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters. So, really happy uh, Karis could join us. Um, and so, to get the whole hour rolling. I'm going to turn it over to Nev. The title of our presentation today is Structural Competency, Discourse, Epistemic Justice, and the Cultural Politics of Identity. Hard questions. So go ahead, Nev. Thank you, Ippi. Hello, everyone. Um, it is really amazing to be here. Um, I will go ahead and share screen. Okay, you guys can all see that. Um, the only thing I want to kind of add to um, Ippi's lovely introduction is to just really emphasize from the kind of perspective of transparency about positionality, I probably will sound very impassioned about the things that I'm talking about. Um, in, in my case, I really come from a place of literally lifelong multi-generational immersion um, in public sector mental health services, specifically um, focused on schizophrenia psychosis um, and, you know, welfare systems, right? Subsidized housing, the Section 8 program, um, housing instability and homelessness, you know, disability-based welfare benefits. So kind of, I, I, I this has so fundamentally shaped um, who I am that 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 naturally enough I do have um, kind of strong feelings and I get passionate when I'm talking about this this stuff. 
So first of all, I want I want to um, I really want to signal um, my deep appreciation for structural competency slash humility and what the sort of structural competency movement has helped um, kind of bring to the fore in terms of medical training, residency, um, and really kind of fanning out into other disciplines um, across areas of health and medicine. Uh, I think that structural competency began to very powerfully foreground structural racism, you know, even before some of the sort of developments of the last four or five years that have really put pressure on schools of medicine, right? Like structural competency was already there, really pushing this agenda in a powerful way. Um, also, just a caveat, uh, the, the, the sort of the critique or set of concerns I'll be raising, I think, are fairly specific to kind of the psychiatry and mental health space. We could have a whole conversation about the interface between sort of kind of physical health, um, mental health differences, but, but for the purposes of this, conf co this presentation, I'm, I'm, I'm really focusing on the, the, the psi spaces. Okay, so general, my general framework for sort of kind of offering or bringing forward these concerns is that it is always critical in a body of discourse, especially as it starts to become more kind of crystal, crystallized, solidified, um, to attend to what is being explicitly challenged and what is not, what is being said and what is going unsaid. And this is true across the board. And also in keeping in mind, to, to, to quote Howard Zinn here, um, this idea that you can't be neutral on a moving train, that often there's a false sense of, well, if we're not saying something, if we're not calling attention to a particular area, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're you know, ignoring it or sending the message that it's not important, we're just not going there. But I think that there's a very complicated kind of politics, in fact, mm -hmm. around, um, uh, again, this, this this issue of what we are drawing to the, you know, to the center from the margins and what we're not um, in a landscape in which there is a kind of a history of hierarchies and historical oppression across all kinds of different vectors, of course, that are influencing medicine and psychiatry. Uh, when we don't, we risk inadvertently in many cases reifying or reinforcing kind of aspects of these existing structural and epistemic hierarchies, um, you know, or kind of instantiations of injustice in structural terms by passively defaulting to the status quo. All right, so that's just the general frame. Now going into the first, what I'll call sort of a hard, hard question for structural competency discourse. So um, I have spent some time <laughs> um, engaging with the kind of structural competency literature and, and for a number of years. And it is, it is pretty common, if not normative, to see terms like mental illness, psychiatric disorder, um, addiction, et cetera, used and used repeatedly and used in terms that we would recognize as fitting and aligning with traditional medical ways of kind of talking about um, right illness disorder. Uh, there is meanwhile, right, decades and decades of critique that is both domestic and international in origin from user survivor psychosocial disability activists. Um, you know, around these constructs and what they mean and what they signal and the contribution they have made to kind of status quo systems of care and societal response to individuals labeled with quote unquote mental illness in general and quote unquote serious mental illness specifically. I think parallels on the drug use side, right? Around drug use versus addictions versus addiction qua kind of a, a, a brain disorder brain-based disorder. I think also from a kind of a critical anthropological perspective, right, we know that illness and disorder are culture-bound constructs, and there are stakes, you know, kind of bound up in that, right, around how we adjudicate the boundaries between the abnormal and the abnormal, the normal and the abnormal, how we think about 
you know, kind of altered states more expansively. So in religious and spiritual and kind of, you know, different non-Western cultural con contexts. Um, and so there's a lot at stake here. There's a lot bound up here. Um, and, you know, then just to just to kind of repeat that for a lot of folks, right, very biomedicalizing and or pathology focused pathology centered thinking um, has been perceived as felt as playing a pretty major role in perpetuating um, kind of the kind of social exclusion and social violence that we see happening vis a vis individuals with psychiatric disabilities. Um, and while these are sometimes dismissed as kind of privileged middle class global north concerns, I want to argue that they're really not. Um, uh, and because I work in global mental health spaces, I do, <laughs> I do run into this, right? So I think that, um, you know, kind of when you really engage with communities um, and kind of, you know, activist initiatives and kind of grassroots work happening, uh, you find a lot of critiques and concerns. And specifically, I think when we look even within a kind of a domestic context at who it is who is kind of who is ending up on the streets, who is ending up kind of caught in the whole poverty trap that is so supplemental social security in this country, um, that a very large number of kind of individuals bound up in these systems are really in a more individual way, really, really kind of pushing back on or just kind of outright rejecting uh, what's wrong with me is that I have a brain disorder. Um, and in a lot of my work, which has really, really uh, deeply engaged qualitatively with kind of public sector mental health clients, especially who have been labeled with psychosis or schizophrenia, um, I think we see a lot of this and coming from a place that in many cases is also explicitly uh, racialized. So one of the uh, young adults I, I interviewed in, in kind of one of the most powerful interviews I've ever personally done, he really had a rather developed analysis of sort of racial genocide through psychosis services, right? Through the way he was treated, um, antipsychotics as a primary response and how that's kind of bound up in a, uh, a kind of really overwriting of people's narratives about what's happened in their lives, very much including structural racism. So I just want to kind of say that. And I think that we see kind of as part of this larger body of discourse that kind of reduces what people are experiencing and the complexities of it to illness disorder, quote unquote, um, we see a normalization then of coercion and carceral kind of mechanisms and responses. And, you know, you guys are there in L.A., the epicenter of the, the California care courts, where this is kind of playing out in real time and almost certainly will disproportionately impact racialized minorities uh, living on the streets and very specifically with psychosis. Okay. Next kind of hard question. So I guess the, the hard question then is where's the engagement, right? Where's the deep engagement between structural competency discourse and the mental health and psi spaces with this entire movement of folks who have really been trying to kind of to push back and to uh, really kind of center concerns around epistemic injustice as well as literally just sort of kind of physical injustice as it plays out in structural injustice justice. So then the hard question to kind of more on this note of kind of epistemic injustice and who tells the story. But here I really want to talk about not just is structural competency engaging, but who do we see represented in uh, in structural competency discourse and training as the as the thought leaders, right, as the thought leaders, as the, you know, kind of authors of, of key pieces. And it's now, a, you know, a big field, right, actually around this. Um, so, uh, again, I think in other areas we have seen a lot of attention in the, in the last five or six years to the sort of the politics of representation in political, in 
academic and clinical spaces and who is being positioned to tell the story, to define, to explain, um, who is positioned as the, the expert. And this really matters. And we see this playing out in problematic ways across the global north, global south hierarchy between, you know, kind of white researchers and, and minoritized ethno-racial groups and um, et cetera, et cetera, but very much also kind of including disability. Uh, and then who is cited and referenced is seen as important. So I have also, uh, I, I, I will say, I've also gone through some key kind of structural competency readings and articles to really look at who is actually being cited and referenced in them. Um, even when the kind of the user survivor movement sometimes is at least mentioned or referenced, um, but often uh, through through the lens of like a non non user survivor uh, author writing about that. Okay, and then the third hard question. So this one is a little bit different. Um, so this, you know, kind of where I first kind of uh, lodged on this is kind of looking at the structural competency intervention and training literature where in some interventions there is an effort to integrate what we might call broadly lived experience in the form of kind of peer support or peer navigators or community health navigators uh etc et now this you know that this then you know also sort of whether intended or not maps on to the hmm. broader kind of workforce hierarchies that have developed around both peer and community health workers. And so I have some concern when people are being brought in, but brought in a way that positions them uh, in a very uh, in a very sort of subjugated, hierarchically kind of subjugated way. Again, it may not be entirely, probably is not intended. I'm not, I'm not talking about kind of intentional uh, subjugation here, but it is the larger structures in which we're operating with if unchallenged, they remain what they are. So there are professional hierarchies at play. And, you know, although a piece of this is that peer and community health workers are positioned at the bottom, um, literally in terms of pay, in terms of influence, in terms of ability to supervise in most systems. This is true across the US, but there's a, a more complex hierarchy, right? And, and I think, you know, I tend to think of this as MDs unequivocally at the top, PhDs below them, licensed master's level professionals below that, BA level type certifications below that, and then further below that peer and community health workers. Um, now, it's not just that there is this professionalized hierarchy, but that it maps out in pay status and power and in the nature of the work that people are performing, right? So MDs in general, um, they're kind of their purview is biomedical and pharmacological intervention. PhDs usually get this higher pay grade because of the ability to do specialized assessment, which is often very reductionistic in its own way. It's neuropsych assessment, but it's seen as specialized and specialized in a way that merits more pay and maps onto more higher status. Um, clinical licensure then, right, for folks who are licensed mental health professionals at the master's level, a lot of that revolving around diagnosis and psychological therapies. Then you have case management below that. So arguably, the activities most tied to addressing structural and social determinants of health have been placed at this level. And then even below that, the sort of complex wraparound type kind of supports and emotional labor being provided provided by peer and community health workers. These are also categories of individuals that are typically selected on the basis of cultural match, ethno-racial, minor, minoritized background, right? In, in California, a lot of that is being, um, you know, bicultural, Latinx, and, and, and Spanish speaking. On the peer side, it's lived experience of public sector mental health services or mental health services. So I, I, I wanna say this is very problematic and something we need to be deeply interrogating. And it just has concerned me to not see that explicitly playing out and kind of tackled uh, in the structural competency space. Okay, so that's, I, I wanted to try to get through this quickly, which I, I hope I have. Ippy, if there's anything that you think I should explain further, because Ippy was like, don't go too fast, but otherwise I will turn it turn it over to to you. 
Great. Well, thanks, Nev, for for um, getting us started. I'm gonna um, to kind of open our discussion. I'm gonna um, invite Helena to maybe share some uh, initial thoughts. Sure. Um, so it's it's thank you, Nev. I think you're right on point with everything that you just presented. I'm gonna try to be short. Please cut me off if I go on for too long because. Um, this has been a very long week. I'm in a very dynamic, shall I say, department. And so, and so uh, my ability to kind of put things together very neatly and in a in a very um concise manner isn't isn't what I would hope it is, it should be. I want to just give a little bit of background on what I think structural competency is, because it occurs to me we're now 10 years into it. It's amazing 10 years have passed since, I think it be you were probably involved in the early structural competency conferences that happened starting in 2012. And it's um, it emerged in a very specific moment, right? So on the one hand, structural competency in my mind is not a program, it's not a platform. It is an orientation to the world. And it's an orientation to the world that we offered up to a very specific group of people. Okay, so what do I mean by orientation to the world? I mean that it did not start off as a way to specifically foster alternatives to what you very neatly laid out as a, an extremely reductionist and oppressive way of looking at quote unquote peer mental health workers. You know, that, nothing like that. We were trying to think of examples for, for certain to flesh out what structure means <laughs> and what competency could mean. Um, but really what we were trying to foster was just the very basic awareness among our colleagues within biomedicine that structures exist. And not only do they exist, but it's possible for clinical practitioners and those who are deep in the belly of biomedicine to begin to understand what is meant by structural drivers of health. Okay, and even to begin to imagine if we do appreciate what they are and what structures are, how would that influence the way that we do medicine? So it's really an orientation to the world. And it, it's hard, I think, for people who haven't been in the belly of biomedicine as long as I have to understand how incredibly novel this is for that was for that group. So by 2012, people who were, who were involved in mad pride, disability rights movements, any kind of social justice movements, and who had not spent their lives training in biomedicine, knew very well on a deep embodied level what structures are, what structural drivers of health are. Also, those of us who are people of color, people who grew up low income, we had an embodied knowledge of those things. But the vast majority of people in biomedicine do not. And there's nothing about biomedical training still that prepares them for that kind of worldview and awareness. So I, I just want to put it out there that it's just an orientation to the world. You learn, to, you learn in biomedical training to see the world in terms of molecules. At one point in, in the history of medicine, you learn to see it in terms of physiological feedback loops in bodies. And we're at a stage where you literally get taught molecular medicine above all else. And we know that that's because that's what's driving profits in for-profit medicine, the kind that we practice here. Molecules are easy to patent and, and produce in saleable form. That's what our medicine consists of right now. So as a biomedical practitioner in this country, you see the world in terms of molecules, quite literally. So it is a, it was a big leap <laughs> for many of our colleagues to begin thinking in terms of structures. And we were really re reacting also to the moment of cultural competency. So I was trained in biomedicine in the 90s under the regime of cultural competency. So um, when Jonathan and I first started writing about structural competency, it really was a reaction to cultural competency, which we felt had been um, really misused to erase institutional factors and policy level drivers, as opposed to a patient's beliefs or behaviors. You know, that the, it was kind of sick the way that culture had all of a sudden been used to, in a way, blame people for their own um, health inequalities. So that was the moment. I think it's, you know, as an anthropologist, I always start off with context. You have to understand the context. So we started off with just an orientation to the world. And um, we said to ourselves, this has a five-year life before it gets 
morphed into something that doesn't resemble what we intended, just like cultural competency did. You know, cultural competency may have had a five year run and then all of a sudden it's um, morphed into something not recognizable to my colleagues who in the 19, early 1990s and the 80s were involved in the cultural competency movement. So we knew we had a short run of it. We knew from the beginning that the term structure, the term competency, so structure in itself is very easy to misinterpret and misunderstand in biomedical context. Just last spring, I went to a NIDA conference on structural racism, where literally most of the attendees who are really well grounded in neuroscience thought that structure meant structures of the brain. You know, either the structure of the neurons or structure the molecular structure of neuroreceptors that are somehow involved in molecular heritable forms, uh, drivers of racial discrimination. So, you know, some of the presentations were on the biological basis for racial discrimination. Um, so, you know, that can be that can be corrupted. But competency we knew from the beginning was very dangerous. It's also been the major way that we've been picked up in mainstream biomedicine, because we were doing this in the height of competencies. So the AAMC that regulates medical schools had come out with, you know, every year it's like 10 additional competencies that medical students are required or residents are required to demonstrate before they can get licensed. And so the language of competency was all over the place. And those of us who do social scholarship, you know, the idea of a boundary object, that when you're trying to connect two vastly different um, worlds, two vastly different bodies of knowledge, you come upon language that may not mean the same thing to both parties, but brings them together in some way because it has purchase. So structure, competency was that kind of term. It's really why people began to pay attention um, in, my, in my view because it fit into that language that was already in circulation in, in biomedicine. But we also knew competency conveyed the very hierarchy that we were trying to push back against. Um, and so that's why we reached out to Jan Murray, Murray Garcia and Melanie Turvalon's cultural humility for structural humility. I actually don't think it's a very strong um, language to counteract this powerful concept of competency that you know all, all the biomedical practitioners have to do is read up on this or that in structural drivers, and then they become, become the expert. And they completely miss that the implication of structural competency, if you're really committed to it, is that you're going to upend that hierarchy. You're going to change the way that you enact power and privilege. And you're going to, as you very well laid out, Nev, you're going to be partnering with people all the way along who you are working with, communities that have been really poorly served by biomedicine and who have to be the drivers of a new medicine, if it's going to be any of any help uh, to the community, if there's going to be any um, impact on racial inequality. So they could, you know, they miss that. And so we're seeing that. We're seeing that all across the board, that that part is not understood. And I think it's perfect. This is the way that the system works. You know, anything that you introduce into a system like we have that's such a robust hierarchy as the biomedicine, the mainstream biomedicine that we we practice and that is at the heart of one of the single largest economic engines in our country, that is a system that will take and metabolize and turn to its own purposes just about everything. So it's the kind of thing that, as you said, it's a moving train. You have to continually uh, reinvent and I guess that I've already been going on for a long time. So I'll just leave you with the thought that, you know, I look forward to working with you and I've certainly been working with others. Many of them, um, people with lived experience of mental difference um, and many of them, people of color and look people from low income backgrounds to come up with other language. I think structural competency, it, it did a certain amount it's probably reached the end of its shelf life in many ways. So we need new terms. We need new terms that convey something beyond mainstream med biomedicine in a more tangible way. Um, I'm thinking about language that captures restorative justice, mutual aid movements, reparations movements. Um, so it's not only what we can do within biomedicine, but how can we support forms of healthcare and health promotion that happen 
way outside of biomedicine and are already active and doing a lot of good. I'm thinking even, you know, urban farming, plant medicine, indigenous apothecary, the use of the arts to promote health. There are just so many things that are so useful um, that are directly addressing the inequalities that we see, even political activism as healthcare and self-care, um, things that happen outside of biomedicine is what I'm saying. So we need new language. And that's what I hope we can continue to talk about. Great. Thanks, Helena, for your very disorganized comments. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think Helena's disorganization is a great sort of model for the rest of us. Organi oh, thank you. The rest That's of our organized minds. <laughs> so I really appreciate it, Helena. <laughs> um, and I'd like to also now uh, turn um, the mic over to our other respond esteemed respondent, which we're really thrilled um, to be able to join us today, Karis Myrick. Um, hi, can you all hear me okay? Okay, cool. So um, I apologize, I joined just a little bit late, but luckily I've had this conversation with both Nev and Helena before. So that's, um, I think, somewhat helpful. Um, and um, interestingly enough, um, I had a meeting here in Oakland at the Oakland Museum of California, which has an Angela Davis exhibit. So I don't know if I'm coming in like right off of that into this and it sort of all fits, but I think it does fit sort of nicely. Um, I'd like to have her start by thinking a little bit too about when we think about structural com competency or structural humility, whichever terms uh, we want to use, um, especially within um, thinking about um, um, lived experience movements. You know, um, I'm going to have to honestly say that the lived experience movement has left <laughs> many people of color behind. So you know, even to think about the MAD movement as being um, a part of or made up of or led by people of color or marginalized groups, I think probably we have to we have to discuss that, right? Like, like I think I think it's fair enough to say that, you know, um, people of color um, um, had certain uh, roles and uh, involvement in the MAD movement. Um, but a lot of times when people talk about MAD movement, consumer survivor, ex-patient movement, they leave out people of color. So, um, you know, we're finding, uh, we've been there all along, we've been doing great work all along and um, dealing with um, um, structures and historical structures that have impacted our very lives since coming out of the womb. And so to think about that then in the space of the intersection between um, being a person of color and also being a person you know, labeled with a mental health condition, sometimes it's not too far of a stretch for us. But um, I, I also wanna um, talk a little bit about um, you know, what has uh, occurred even in the peer movement. So when I say the peer movement, I'm now talking about a workforce as Nev was alluding to, you know, your supporters, community health workers, promotores, et cetera, that are this allied health profession or quote unquote paraprofessional. So in California, for example, as in other states, um, we did have to have um, legis well, we had to have legislation passed in order for peers, people with lived experience who were trained to provide support um, to other people, um, be able to bill Medicaid, which is Medi-Cal in California. So um, when you um, do that, uh, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services requires that the state set up particular guidelines, right? That you have to have training, that training has to have competencies, and you have to list those competencies. So um, we do, as do other professions, have a list of competencies, um, and um, among them is cultural competency. And everybody was super excited about that, and I said, Harris Myrick here in California, it's not enough. We also need to look at what we would call quote unquote structural competence. So I'll say quote unquote because a lot of people didn't know what that, that is. They don't know what it is. It's, it's, it's not that it's a new term. It's a term within the framework of our work we have never used. So um, I started to describe what structural competency is and it's taking cultural competency, which we think of more at the individual level and making sure we can support somebody at the individual level and in understanding or uh, you know, being culturally, having cultural humility at the individual level. But now we're looking at systems and structural issues that um, impede, our abil impede um, people's ability to uh, live their life to the fullest. I'll just put it that way, because their structures and barriers, for example, might be something around um, 
poverty, or it may be something around housing or things like that. So as I talked about this, quite frankly, I got a lot of bite back. And the bite back was this. As peers, we don't do that. We don't deal with that. We only work with people at the individual level. And that was it. We're not going to have structural competency as part of our competencies, as part of our training. And I thought that was really interesting because as part of our training and as part of our core competencies, we actually have um, self and system advocacy. So what is the difference? And, and I'm just begging a question here. What is the difference? The difference is now it's framed in uh, people who are minoritized, people who are racialized, people transgender, you know, all of these things that suddenly, no, we couldn't, we can't advocate for that as peers, but we can help people advocate for themselves at the individual level, or we can advocate against the system that doesn't understand that, you know, we can uh, experience mental health um, struggles in all sorts of ways. Um, so I, it, it was just really striking to me that it was very hard for people to understand the importance of understanding where structures lay that can cause mental distress, emotional distress, particularly for minoritized, racialized folk, that we didn't want to do that as peers. So I, I, I want to be clear and kind of say we have talked about this. Now, I thought, I thought about this long and hard enough that, in fact, we do have structural competency as one of the competencies in our training for peers in California. Now, the fact that nobody wanted it and the fact that people don't know what it is, I don't know what the heck they're going to be trained on. This is because nobody does that training. So I don't know what training has been developed that actually addresses structural competency or structural humility from the peer and lived experience practice space. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what people have done. I don't know who's checking to see, is it really it? Um, and that is a little bit concerning. The other thing I think that... Um, you know, that kind of kind of says is that uh, uh, it, uh, something else had come up in this conversation, which was we don't, um, we don't, a comment that was made was that um, as peers, we don't want to understand, and again, I'm not saying all peers, I, I want to be careful here, I'm not saying all peers, but the, the concern was that, especially coming from some of the black peers is we don't want to talk about the structures and the barriers, especially the historical stuff that has caused us so much pain over the years. We don't want to talk about that. It's too harmful. It's too traumatizing. And um, sadly, though, we do have to recognize that. We do have to talk about it. And it does have to be put in the framework of understanding why somebody is struggling and as a peer and either as a provider who is not a peer, how are we supporting that person? Um, and how are we breaking down those barriers and those structures that continue to perpetuate the harms to that person? So um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done. I think there is something about language and competency that sort of kind of gets people stuck. <laughs> um, there's, I think, you know, even in the peer and lived experience space and understanding and being able to uh, contend with the disparities that uh, people of color face um, who also have a lived experience of a mental health condition and particularly you know, schizophrenia or psychosis and the like, that um, we're, we're gonna have to contend with those intersectionalities. Um, and to do that together with providers and people with lived experience and peers who provide services is going to be critically important. So we're all moving together and not like people playing catch up. You know, because um, I feel like in, in some ways, um, as lived experience folks, uh, sometimes, you know, we may be playing catch up to try to help uh, course correct what's happening on the medical side, rather than us working together. So there's no course correction. We're actually working together and informing from each side of the experience. That's the humility side, right? Um, and, and lastly, you know, uh, Nev did bring up care courts and um, it was very, very hard in California uh, for there to be an understanding of the grave disparities and why those disparities exist, those structural barriers that exist for people that perpetuate um, high levels of homelessness, misdiagnosis of schizophrenia, particularly for black men, that then um, now, because of this new law, this new structure, this new 
strategy, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's, it's a law, you know, um, will look at, you know, two factors, homelessness and psychosis or schizophrenia, um, not just homelessness, but um, ongoing homelessness, chronic homelessness, um, schizophrenia as two factors to, to um, uh, uh, recommend that people go into a court process in order to get care. But how did people get become homeless in the first place? Why are African American men overdiagnosed with schizophrenia or experiencing psychosis that now a court has to fix the black man, not fix the system and the structures that cause the thing that um, is exacerbating either getting the right treatment, getting treatment um, earlier on, getting supports earlier on. So those are the kind of things that um, I hope you don't mind that that you know I've been thinking about as you know, as Nev has talked about um, structural competency and concern about uh, the participation and um, co-development with people with lived experience, I think we also have to say which people with lived experience. So to make sure that people of color who uh, sometimes are have a different um, relationship with these things um, are also part of that discussion and part of that um, uh, co-creation. So thanks for letting me um, respond. Thanks, Karis. Um, so we have a lot has been put on the table. Um, has structural competency outlived its utility or has it really not circulated enough? Have folks not had a chance to grapple with it? Um, and and um, and what, what does the professionalization of, of peers do? What, what does that make think, what does that uh, sort of encourage, how does that encourage peers to think about themselves? Um, now, maybe before we open up the discussion more broadly. Nev, do you want to respond at all, Nev? And then we can kind of open up to sort of the broader um, sort of audience here for a bigger discussion. Sure. Um, just so, I, I mean, I, a couple of things I would throw on the table is that the, especially if we like expand out to the global landscape, extremely complicated, all the vectors and hierarchies um, because I've been doing more work in the global space, also enormous concerns on the part of activists in the global south about anyone in the global north and their discourse, their activist discourse. And also, I just want to, and Karis, you missed this, but I do really want to highlight that also activism in this space is not a product of the global north. It is not. And um, so if we look and, uh, you know, at, at what has been happening globally at activism, traditions in Latin America. I just want to say it's it's also not that I am talking about American or US, you know, activists. It is really kind of having to had, having to break out of that mindset. And I want to emphasize that second thing, huge politics of representation in activist movements. And again, Karis missed this, but I really want to emphasize that who I am thinking about is folks literally on the ground, on the streets, who are not claiming an activist identity, who are pushing back against medicalized ways of understanding their experiences. And I think, you know, anybody who does work, you know, on the streets or in the public sector is going to hear this, is going to see this, right? That there is rejection in a deeply grassroots, bottom up way that that is a separate thing from what act of us are or aren't saying and is really, really important and more where my heart is. People on the ground, um, deeply impacted, ending up in jails, prisons, the streets, and they are not saying, we love the idea of mental illness, it's great. They wouldn't be there if this discourse and the way it structured our services made sense in many ways. So I just want to acknowledge that. Going to um, some of Helena's points, I think my question is still, my hard question back is still, it's what choices have been made about what has been sacrificed and what is, is preserved when examples are given. So this was sort of my like kind of my frame for this, right? It's, it's what are we talking about versus not? Um, and I just think that that's really, really important. And what happens is, marginalization stacks on marginalization historically and then it's occurring across all these vectors global geopolitics race in the u.s or in you know anglophone high-income countries specifically um 
you know, poverty and class majorly shaping this space as well. So there's all these different vectors, but it's a question of what are we bringing to the fore intentionally knowing this history and what are we not? And so part of my concern is, is, is really there um, around uh, the and it is globalized. It's it's a it's a it's a global north export. It's really a neo-colonial export, really kind of starting in the UK, um, in terms of this biomedicalized way of understanding people's experiences. So I just want to come back to that as because I think if one is not frontally challenging that, one is not frontally challenging that. Um, uh, so, 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 so I just, I don't, I don't know how we kind of, how we get there because, and maybe, maybe it is because the shelf life has expired, but I see structural competency happening in psychiatry programs with absolute and total inattention to uh, critique whether they're coming from real people, just individuals who have no access to academic spaces or coming from, you know, kind of self-positioned activists, push back against these sort of biomedicalizing, reductionist, pathologizing narratives of their experiences, and that this has happened all over the world, really. So I, I guess I just want to push on yeah. certain can, things. Can I respond to that? And I, I actually see some people on the screen who I know could contribute a lot to, there are several questions embedded in that. <laughs> One is, um, you spoke somewhat in the passive voice about what, what structures, what problems, what issues are being taken up. And so my response to that is we have to ask who <laughs> and for what reason. So structural competency may not be a useful language um, for some groups that really want to critique the wholesale biomedicalization of psychic experience. It may or may not be useful. I, I think it still can be useful to those of us who are working from within biomedicine to try to bring a critical lens to what we do and the role of biomedicine in creating inequalities and structures of oppression, uh, because that is that was really the initial impulse. You know, just if, if you look at the work of Ippy and Kelly Knight, who's on the screen and Jonathan Metzel and the whole group of us who have kind of taken this up and tried to see how far we can get, it's really been an attempt to get critical thinking inside of the heart of biomedicine. Um, we are people who are working in medical schools, teaching medical students and preoccupied with a very thin sliver of the larger issue, right? That we're a very sli thin sliver of those who need to organize to push back against the harms of a very marginalizing and segregating biomedicine that we practice. So, um, so we have to be, we, can, we can't talk in passive voice. We have to talk about, well, who is using it and for what purpose? And maybe it's not useful for certain things. I don't know, but I know that when it's, um, when it's conducted in the spirit in which it was started, really the out the the end point is a critique of one's own biomedical practice and the institutions in which we're working, the institutions in which we're practicing by bio, practicing biomedicine and the health policies and economic engines that support the biomedicine. So it's a turning on ourselves. The structural analysis turns on ourselves, and that includes the language that we use, the pathologizing and marginalizing and segregating language that we use, including to when it comes to psychic and mental difference. So, um, but I think it's useful to a thin sliver. You know, I don't know that structural competency is use useful to the whole world. I really don't. And then you identified a second issue, which is something that those of us who are in this very tiny network of um, critical thinkers within biomedicine, you know, working in academic medical centers with some training and background in social um, scholarship to support this critical thinking. And then many of us with lived experience to support the critical thinking. It's a very small network. And we're grappling all the time with the fact that we're working within a system of academic medicine where the critical thinking is very, very rare. This kind of critical thinking is very rare. And those of us who are trying to promote it are, we're kind of small salmon swimming upstream. 
Uh, and we're working very hard to build up networks nationally so that we can share resources with each other, really foster investments in critical scholarship in academic medicine to push back against these enormous forces of molecularizing life and through that molecularization, erasing the political and economic drivers of the way that our biomedicine is practiced and the, um, the real sources of the inequalities that we're encountering. So we're a very small group. And I, you know, I, I, Kelly, if you feel like at some point jumping into this, um, I want to credit Kelly Knight, who's I think calling in from UCSF, where she has built up a really robust what she calls structural competency program and a train the trainer program and really operationalized it in a way that's thoughtful and extremely critical. Um, so I'm constantly sending people to Kelly when they come to me and say, what the heck is structural competency number one, but how do you actually do it? You know, So I send them to her because she's done so much to operationalize it using the best of you know, critical scholarship and, and action. Um, but we're a tiny group. So you know, I think what you're, you're, put, you're putting your finger on incredibly big needs, structural competency can't work for everybody to address the big structural problems that you're absolutely right about that we need to address. Kelly, did you want to, did you sure, feel like? I mean, I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to say a, a, a quick few things. I mean, I'll say first, I, I really agree, um, uh, Nev and Karis, with your critiques of structural competency. So as somebody who's who has been for a seven years or so trying to um, to figure out how to operationalize or think about uh, structural competency in the context of medical education as it exists, and 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 it, you know that it it has been organized in the service of medicine, and I think that that's one of the huge problems that that we're coming to um, now. I will say at UCSF we've developed alternatives to structural competency as a result. Um, and I think those are really important to point out. So while structural competency still exists in some um, limited and limiting forms that you, you know, consistent with the critiques that you described, Nev, um, here at UCSF, we also have the repair project, which is a, which is a much more uh, critical um, abolitionist, anti-racist, anti-colonial space that's taking up, I think, many of the issues that, um, that you are raising as not happening in, in structural competency in, in, in quite the way that, that you've seen it in your reviews of some of the literature. And it, and it is diversifying in some really significant and, um, and unintended ways as things do, as Helena pointed out. Um, and so I do think we need to think about that vocabulary and what structural competency is being made to stand in for right now that, that I think it shouldn't um, and was never intended to, but I think it's raising critique that's really important. And the other is the Community Grand Rounds project, which is a, which is a project that we did with residents uh, in the Tenderloin and service providers and some students and critical social scientists that where we took structural competency, the limits of it, and then flipped it on its head and developed an alternative curriculum um, for healthcare professionals, really drawing from some of the critiques that you've raised. And I'd be happy to, to talk more if you're interested in, in both of those projects here. But I think it's just a small example. And that's sort of outside of other abolitionist work that, that those of us involved in structural competency work are involved um, in that really has to exist outside of medicine. I just, I have very little um, I have a lot of cynicism and very little faith in 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 being able to es escape the harms of biomedicalization with structural competency or many other frames. So, so yes, <laughs> um, and and you know, and I'm really invested in trying to have a conversation of where do we go from here um, because I, I really appreciate um, both the, the, um, what you, Karis, and, and Nev raised today. So thank you. I just want to say that's awesome to hear about, and uh, I don't know if you can post links in the chat for anyone who might not already know about sort of how to read more and, and engage with what you're describing. And and I'm glad you bring up abolition. I think that's such a rich topic, too, is like the sort of abolitionist perspectives meet all of this. Uh, likewise, <laughs> abolition and, and a psychiatry are a hard, <laughs> a hard combo. And I just comment on what Kara said, which was also 
incredibly well placed and timed. So she brought up intersectionality. And I just want to comment that intersectionality is something that often comes up and hangs up conversations with practitioners um, around structural drivers of health inequalities. So you kind of even to get what's meant by intersectionality, you have to understand that there are structures that intersect, you know, in forms of oppression that intersect. And so I think you're right on target in calling attention to that. Um, and related to that, Kelly expressed pessimism about working within academic medicine. We're in something of what's turned into a support group also. You know, we're an action group, but also a support group of people who are trying to foster critical approaches within academic mainstream biomedicine. So I can be discouraged, but I also think that there still is a role for it. I still, there still is a role for fostering critical work within academic medicine. We're one tiny sliver, uh, but there are so many ways that those of us who have intersectional identities, who are working within biomedicine, but also have other perspectives that we bring to bear, um, whether it's lived experience or critical scholarship, critical thinking that comes from somewhere, um, we have a role to play as well. We have a role to play in, in exploding from the inside. And the more you learn, for example, about the history of healthcare in this country and the moments of progressive turns within um, mainstream healthcare, the more you appreciate these kinds of intersectional insiders. Uh, I'll just give a tiny example about um, Medicaid and the fact that black doctors played an incredibly important role and they were organized amongst themselves and they were positioned to really foster from the inside and work with allies, white allies from within biomedicine um, against the grain at the time. So I just wanna say, I think there's a role, it's limited, it doesn't solve everything, but I, would, I don't wanna leave academic medicine and give up on what I see as a rising generation. Um, there are more and more critical thinkers that I'm encountering in medical school classes. I'm focusing on medicine because that's what I know the best, but I have colleagues in other fields of healthcare, social work, nursing, that are seeing similar things, that there is a, a, a rising generation that is much more critical in its thinking. And we need to be there to help organize them to shift the tide because there are, there's so much money and resource in biomedicine. Anything we can do to divert <laughs> those resources from their original intent and work from within, um, I think is, is worth supporting. And we need to be there for them. So Kelly, don't leave. And those that are working on the outside, you have, you know, your work is incredibly critical and in the end, more influential, right? Um, but hopefully we can cross link and work together. It's, it's still worth trying to explode biomedicine from the inside. And I think Nev, you're, you're an insider also. So you know what I'm talking about. It's tricky territory, but it's worth doing. So it does feel like the discussion is just getting started, even though we only have two minutes. <laughs> um, uh, we do have a question in the comments from Noe Chavez. I wonder if we have time to uh, address this. Um, she asks, uh, how does Freire's critical pedagogy practice fit here for challenging medical education or humanizing medical practices or supporting grassroots participatory work to envision and realize new medical paradigms? And Noe, if you, if you want to speak out, you're welcome to, but we could also just uh, address your question. Uh, no, I, I, you know, I just, just appreciate the space for conversation. I've just been listening and, you know, um, a lot that I'm new to sort of the area. So I'm learning a lot, uh, a, a, a lot of stuff. So this is great. And yeah, just that question and wondering, I'm a community psychologist. So a lot of sort of my training is in critical perspectives and thinking of praxis and, um, you know, from like liberation psychology and wondering how some of those frameworks might be helpful in, in this effort. Yeah, but thank you. 
Uh, I just I'll really quickly say I, I think uh, Chris Montenegro is doing um, really, really interesting work and looking at the kind of the Frarian legacy in Latin America and what has happened to it and how it intersects with the kind of the contemporary status of psychiatry and what's happening. Um, uh, so it, it, it seems like such a rich area because uh, it, 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 it is a complex legacy, even in, you know, Brazil and, and, and Chile, where he's working uh, and thinking about why sort of what's happened, even in those contexts has 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 happened. Um, but also even in even in global north contexts where consciousness raising and, and conscientization were such dominant forces in movements in the 60s and 70s and oh sure one still hears these phrases but in in some way it has really dropped out of a lot of what we see happening um and peer support to speak to some of Karis's concerns um you know is is really a disjuncture between early organizing that was so premised on consciousness raising and and where things are are at in a lot of places now yeah, I think that's well put. And I just want to say, not as not visible, but still very active. I would say that there are a number of movements that are really centered on free area and um, pedagogy. And um, if you we can look at Los Angeles, my colleague Denise Shervington, who's chair of psychiatry at Charles Drew University, which is an historically black medical school, now Hispanic serving organization, quote unquote because of the large Latinx community in South LA, where it is founded on the heels of the 69 Watts rebellion. Um, she Look at her book, Healing is the Revolution. She's uh, She comes to us from post-Katrina New Orleans and has done a tremendous amount around the country with colleagues who are doing critical consciousness-based um, programs to address historical trauma. So the way that she practices psychiatry is deeply rooted in understandings of historical trauma as well as intersectionality, the kinds of things that Karis raised. So these things are happening. They always have been happening. They are still very marginal <laughs> to mainstream biomedicine in any way. Um, but, you know, Paolo Freire has not died. You know, we are still living in his legacy and drawing on him in a really active way. And I'm really glad that you bring him up as a big source of inspiration for alternative praxis. Can I bring up something? I know we're at time, but um, and this is not really the deepest area of my expertise, but more of um, just how I collect information and store it in my brain somewhere. I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, but um, I um, remember reading about the um, Lagrange, Lagrange huh, uh, clinic in Harlem. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think that is such a beautiful example of uh, doing things that work for the community, by the community, and addressing for the community, which in Harlem is, you know, majority Black at the time, back in the 50s and 40s, and um, the doctors there realizing that it wasn't the medical interventions that the people needed, it was the social interventions, the, you know, breaking down of some of the structural barriers, et cetera, in order to help people move towards their ultimate wellness, we would say maybe recovery today, or flourishing, whatever. And what was interesting is when um, it was time to um, apply for um, Medicaid as well as government funding to support the clinic, they were denied that funding. They did not qualify. So what I'm saying is that sometimes the structure in which medicine sits is the very problem in and of itself. So how do you break free of that structure that's binding you in not to do some of the things that feel um, you know, uh, it's almost like a meta, 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 like you, you're just circling around. And I think that also has to be a part of when we think about, um, you know, those structural issues. That's a big one, how you get paid, who pays you, and that dictates what you do and sometimes how you do it, which doesn't fit how people work. So, thanks. And by the way, peers, got, peers are bought up into that now too, because we are billing Medicaid. So, right. and sometimes we don't recognize that and, and it's a surprise. Well, we have to take notes. We have to, you know, make notations on people. Well, yes, that's why you're building Medicaid. So I think that becomes part of our own problem though it was something that we really wanted without recognizing the strings and the things that come along with it. Well, I think 
it is a few minutes after two. I want to give people a chance, you know, um, we always go for an hour. So I guess to, to officially end our, uh, our program, thanks everyone. I think clearly we really do need, um, we need people inside the system to try to change exactly the kind of stuff you're talking about, Karis. Um, but we, we for sure need um, connections outside of medicine, right? To bring some of this innovative thinking, uh, some of these ideas in and, and really uh, find ways to, um, you know, to work against these structural inequalities and, and to sort of take over uh, the system somehow. <laughs> so um, thank you everyone. Uh, and again, this is like Helena said in the beginning, this is, we kind of hope this is the beginning uh, of a conversation about, about really um, all the directions we could be moving forward together in. So thanks everybody for, for coming together and uh, sharing your experience, uh, you know, and, and sharing your knowledge. And I, I, I just looking at all the participants, I really wish we could hear from more of you guys. Um, so we'll have to do this again soon. Thank you. Thank you.